It is our pleasure to welcome you to ESPC20 Online. We are delighted to introduce you to this session about decoding audit events in Office 365, delivered by Tony Redmond. So, welcome everybody to a session about decoding Office 365 audit events, which sounds the most horrible title in the world, but I think that you'll find it interesting. Uh, at least I hope so. My name is Tony Redmond. Uh, I've been around for quite a while uh, in the Office 365 world. Before that, in email and collaboration and all that for the last, uh, oh gosh, 40 years nearly at this point. So I've seen a few things and hopefully some of that experience will come through. But anyway, what I want to talk about here is what I call the magic of auditing, which again, I know that sounds boring, but you know what? Sometimes you need these audit events because as we'll see later on, Audit events are a really interesting way to find out what's happening in your tenant. So before we get there, we'll have to talk about how they're generated, how to access those events, what those uh, events contain. And the thing to remember going into this is that every single one of the workloads that exist within Office 365 generate a slightly different kind of audit event. So we'll have to talk about interpretation and how to extract information to make it useful, put it into a format that you can understand and, and make use of. And then finally, I want to talk about how to use audit events to solve common problems. And, and by that, I mean, you know, administrators, tenant administrators are asked questions all the time. Who did what, when, and where? And often we don't know, because unless you're standing beside somebody and looking over their shoulder, you probably can't uh, know exactly what they've done. But audit events are a bit like, um, I don't know, leave, people leaving fingerprints. And you can go and have a look at those fingerprints and figure out, figure out what they did. So we'll talk about how to do that uh, as we go through the, the session. So a little bit of history, a little bit of background, because you know everything in life has got a history and it's got a background and that contributes to where we uh, get to. Uh, those of us that have been around a while will probably remember that uh, a lot of Office 365 came from on-premises servers, and those services have their own approach to auditing, if at all. You know, SharePoint had its own way of doing it, and Exchange had its own way of doing it. Uh, in the Exchange context, there were actually two types of audits. There were a mailbox auditing and administrative auditing. But as things came up to the cloud, as Office 365 developed, um, the a couple of things started to happen. Firstly, there's a lot more functionality. Secondly, the applications are far more intertwined with each other than they are in on-premises. And third, there are new applications like Teams and Planner and Yammer. Uh, so the need, the obvious need existed for a way to track activities across all of these um, uh, workloads, including Azure Active Directory, which of course is a really important component for Office 365. And that's what drove Microsoft to come out in 2016 with uh, the uh, Office 365 audit log. And the audit log is a common repository for audit events generated by all of the uh, workloads across the ecosystem. Now, not all workloads generate uh, audit events. It's, it takes time for uh, programmers, developers to figure out how uh, what kind of uh, audit events need to be generated, uh, how to generate them, how often to generate them, and so forth and so on. But essentially, you can look at the Office 365 audit log as a, as a common repository for all of these events gathered from across the entire ecosystem. There's a one-time enablement re required to set up the audit log. It's done through the uh, Security Compliance Center. You can read about how to do that online. But once that happens, then ingestion starts. And ingestion is the process of bringing events in from workloads into the audit log. And as we'll see, there's a certain amount of processing required. It's uh, after, uh, at the start in 2016, it seems so long ago now, the, the, um, there were a relatively small number, but important, workloads that uh, uh, provided events, things like Exchange and SharePoint, and OneDrive and Azure Active Directory. So the basic fundamentals were laid down. And over time, pretty well all of the Office 365 work, five workloads are now generating events, including even down to things like shifts inside Teams. Uh, 
if recently Sway was the first workload to cease generating audit events, which was a, a little bit of a pity, but then again, perhaps it's a, an indication of a low use of Sway or uh, a lack of interest in, in, in Sway events. Uh, but the point is, is that there's a, an increasing volume of events, there's an increasing uh, volume of workloads and type of events that, that you can get to deal with. Audit uh, uh, data is only kept if you have the right licenses. And indeed, you can only generate audit events if you have the right licenses. And basically, the, uh, the bar is set by Office 365 E3. If you have E3, uh, Office 365 will keep all the data for 90 days. If you have Office 365 E5, it'll keep it for 365 days. Now, it's a per user license, so you can have a situation where uh, some users have E3 and some users have E5, and you can then have a situation where for some users, events are kept for 90 days and others 365 days. Uh, it's a little bit messy there, but you know it's just things to, to think, uh, keep in your back of your mind. And then the last point here is that there, Microsoft has recently started to introduce what they call high value audit events. Now these are events that uh, Microsoft say are really, really, really interesting because they help people track down and investigate what happens inside a, of a system. The first event they introduced earlier on this year in uh, March, I believe it was February, March, was the mail items accessed events. And this is an event that tracks people's access to messages inside a mailbox. Why is that important? Well, because a, a heck of a lot of um, penetrations of Office 365 come through email. Attackers go after email. They find it a way to that that's relatively easy to penetrate because of the prevalence of use of basic authentication, which is the thing that Microsoft's trying to get rid of across Office 365. But you know, there's a lot of people who've got uh, who use basic authentication with their connections to uh, exchange online. So the mailboxes do get uh, penetrated. And the value of the mail items access event is that it tells you what somebody did inside a mailbox in terms of accessing messages. And so Microsoft thought that this is a high value event. And you, need, and, and you don't get this um, free with Office 365 E3. You have to have an E5 or a Microsoft 365 E5 compliance license uh, to see these events. Uh, one reason why I, I suspect that Microsoft wants uh, people to pay for this is, of course, a, there is a phenomenal number of events of this type generated inside an audit log. And any busy uh, tenant for any relatively busy mailbox, you will see maybe hundreds of thousands of events generated in, in a short period. So anyway, that's the history and that's the background. In terms of ingestion, which is a, a thing I mentioned earlier on, so you have the thing where the audit events are generated by the workloads and then they're generated, they're ingested, which is a process uh, way of saying that they're taken into the audit log at intervals. So the interval is roughly about 15 minutes from it for the uh, basic workloads. It could be a couple of hours for some of the other workloads. And literally billions of events are processed every month. Those, each of these events as they go through the normalization process is normalized. And this is a process to make sure that all the events have got some standard data that you can rely on that exists in every single audit event. So I've listed three here. One is creation date, obviously the date and time stamp for when an audit event occurred. User IDs is the reference to the UPM of, of the user who uh, created the event or is associated with an event. And operations is what they did. So for example, if they modified a file, it would be a file modified operation. What's really critical to understand is that after these normalized events, after these set of standard uh, 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 fields, which are properties that you find in every event, you're going to have workload specific data. And this is the, where by far the most interesting because it actually tells you what happened. Inf information is stored. And it, it's kept in a, in a JSON format in a property called audit data. And audit data is a thing that you will have to interpret time after time after time to extract information that, that you need to analyze just what went on. The important thing, really critical important thing to understand is that the format and the information contained in audit data differs. So if you take an exchange event and look at all the data, you'll see a certain set of properties there. 
and you'll be able to interpret exactly what they are. If you go to SharePoint, you'll see a different set. If you go to Teams, it'll be a different event. Zero Active Directory, different. So there's a, a process that you have to go through to actually understand what's in audit data for each type of event you're dealing with, and then to interpret it and extract it into a format that you can deal with and perhaps use for analysis. And we'll, we, we'll see that as we get to looking at some examples. Okay, I said that the audit uh, data helps uh, administrators answer questions. Here are some of the really simple questions that uh, people ask all the time that are answered by uh, the audit event or audit or by analysis rather of audit uh, events you know, if you go to the audit log. So who created a, a group? Be it a security group or as it says here, a Microsoft 365 group and then added users to the group. That's kind of important. If you, if you have, for example, a, a policy that allows uh, users to add new teams, add new groups, well, this is a way of keeping in track of how many groups have been added, who's adding them, what have they been used for. Next thing, guests. Guest users are added by all sorts of applications, anything from sharing a document in SharePoint to adding a group to uh, a team, or adding a guest to a team, you know, you're, you, after a while in any moderately busy tenant, you will probably have hundreds, maybe thousands of guests. So do you need to keep those guests around? What are they doing? So answer a question. When did the guest user last sign into Teams? Simple stuff. Who changed the document? Now, I guess, um, you know, this answers a question that people have always had around documents when edits were made and who actually changed that document? Why did you change it, et cetera? Well, there's an order record there for that. Who or what, because it could be a policy assigned a sensitivity label or a retention label to a document. Again, uh, it's not only to understand uh, why people are assigning these, these type of labels to documents, but it's to uh, assess the volume of activity to know whether or not your data uh, governance policy is being uh, used, whether or not people have actually looked at these uh, labels, say, yeah, we understand how to use them, we can go and do that without any problem. Who sent that mail? That's uh, the send as event. Again, you know, if you have something like a shared mailbox, which is dealing with customers, you may want to know who uh, actually did the sending from the, from the mailbox to a specific customer at a particular day. Stream gets an awful lot of uh, use these days, even if you don't know that it's happening because it's where uh, Teams recordings go. So who's recording and who's uploading videos to Stream? Why would you like to know that? Well, it gives you a sense of what's happening inside Teams. It also gives you a sense of how much uh, space is being occupied in Stream and every tenant has got a, uh, uh, a certain quota for stream storage, so you may want to, to, to know about how that is that, that quote has been used. And the last example I've got here is who runs content searches? Uh, content searches are used to find information for something like e-discovery cases, and normally they're absolutely perfect, no problem with them whatsoever, but you can have things that where administrators maybe run content searches against interesting uh, mailboxes are interesting sites to find information that they shouldn't really be looking at. And so sometimes it's a good idea to just say, okay, who's been running content searches in a tenant? And let's have a look and understand exactly why those searches are being run. And then more importantly, what happened after the search was run? Did somebody open up any of the information that was returned by the search? Just to know. Okay, so now we know uh, what kind of questions we can answer. How do we get to this information? Well, there's two basic ways. One is through the compliance center, which is a GUI where you can do a search and the search has got all the kind of GUI features that you want, like date range. Remember that it's a 90 day range for E3 and 365 uh, days for E5 users, uh, the type of events you want to look and so forth and so on. And it's, it'll spit out uh, events just like it shows here on the screen. You can see the, the standard uh, fields, the standard properties if you want, which are at the top, and then the work, uh, uh, workload specific information, which is uh, under the more information tab. Uh, and you can see there's quite a lot of information here. So, uh, and this in fact uh, relates to the placing of a retention label 
on a file. So that gives you an in insight into the kind of information that uh, that is found. And as it's pointed out on the little label that's assigned there, all the stuff under more information comes from that audit data field. So that gives you a sense of the kind of importance of understanding that field. Now, searching for stuff through the GUI is fine to find things that you know you're looking for, but sometimes you don't know what you're looking for. You need to throw out a big net and start to refine things. Or you need to find, do a very precise search to get a lot of information and crunch that information. And that's where you're going to be using PowerShell. And the uh, uh, command that you want to search Unified Audit Log, which is part of the Exchange Online uh, module, uh, that gives you access to all of the information inside the Audit Log, including some events that are not exposed in the Compliance Center. The reason why is that if new events are added by a workload, it can, there can be a lag before the GUI is updated to allow you to select that event to search for it. Whereas as soon as it's uh, added, to uh, the audit log is going to be available uh, through PowerShell. The general approach I take when I look for events uh, through PowerShell is to first use the GUI to have a quick scan. I have a general idea of the kind of event I want, but I may want to find out exactly uh, the name of the operation. And that's one of those standard fields because that, that's going to make it a lot easier to use with PowerShell. So I'll use the GUI to scan for the kind of events I'm looking for. If I find an example, then I'll have a general idea of what I can what I can get. And then I'll move to PowerShell, where I'll start to do a search, which I'll uh, include details of things like the users I'm, I'm interested in, the workloads, the operations, the date range, et cetera, et cetera. That can send me back up to 5,000 records at a time. You can, uh, by a, a paging mechanism, retrieve uh, up to 50,000 records by paging in at 5,000 at a time. But generally, you know, if you're doing a, a straightforward search, 5,000 records uh, should be enough. Uh, once I've got the information returned by the search, I'll parse the information. Uh, as I make the point here, it's a definite trial and error uh, process that it's needed to go through to have a look at the, what's content, what the content of the audit data property and to interpret, uh, break it out from JSON using the uh, convert from JSON uh, commandlet and interpret all the different uh, fields you find there to see what's interesting, see what you need and see what you need, might need to extract from it. And then finally, uh, what I normally do is I report the information. I create a report. I, uh, I use a PowerShell list object to put all the information in there to create a report. And then I can export the information that I found to another tool, uh, whatever you want, Excel with the CSV file to Power BI or whatever you want to use to go and do the final analysis. But this is the general approach that is, that is normally used to find information and extract it using PowerShell. So this is an example of some PowerShell. Yeah, look at it, oh, lovely PowerShell. And this is basically doing a, a simple search, fairly simple search, as you can see that I'm saying, go and search the audit blog, use it for 90 days, 90 day range, go back 90 days, okay, using the get date. And the operations that I want is, I want to find out anything that, uh, anything to do in any event that, that exists in the log for add group which is the creation of a new group, right? Now, if I had multiple operations, what I could put there is I could put an array of operations that I had set up before, PowerShell array, or I could simply put all the different uh, operations in a line, separate it, you know, as I said, their add group, that's one value, and then I'd separate the other values out with a comma. So I'd have a set of comma separated values there for the, the multiple operations that I want. And I've told PowerShell that I want, I'm willing to accept up to a thousand records in return. Once I get those records back, I then process them. This is the, the, the thing I said earlier about going and uh, having a look at that audit data uh, field and extracting information, which is exactly what we're doing there. For every record, get audit data, convert it from JSON, and then take that information out of JSON, all the information I want. So uh, if you can see the information I'm putting into each line of my report, I put in the timestamp, the user, the action, the status of the action, 
And then I'm interested in some other things. For example, I'm interested, very interested in the group name of the new group. But that's hidden, as you can see here, in a, in a particular uh, part of the audit data record in a field called target. Dot ID, but ID is a, an array, so I have to pick out different parts of the array to get the group identifier, which is the GUID for the group that I can use for uh, with other PowerShell command lists to find the group or to interact with the group, and, and the group name, which is in another part of the array. And it's painful at times to actually, you know, go through all the data and extract the bits and pieces you want for each each um, each type of event. But after a while, it, it gets second nature. Once I've done that, bang, I've got a report, and I've got the report, I can uh, then start doing basic PowerShell analysis with it. Uh, the last line here of the, the script just uh, uh, outputs the timestamp workload user and group name just to give me a basic list of uh, what groups have been created. Simple stuff. There's nothing very complicated in terms of PowerShell here, and it just proves how accessible the audit log is in terms of going and getting information from it. And here's what you might get. Simple stuff. Right. It's important though to also realize that the audit uh, log is used for uh, other purposes. You know, it's a big source of information. There's a lot of data there. So if you use Microsoft Cloud App Secure, Cloud App Security, that should say, uh, rather, uh, or the Office 365 version of uh, Cloud App Security, you find that events from the audit log flow to it as well. So it's not like uh, the, these uh, applications get their information from another sort. They get it directly from the Office 365 uh, audit log. And um, so they suffer from the same kind of uh, information problem. You know, if information is captured in the audit log, it's not going to get into Cloud App Security. The same is true of alert policies and activity alerts. An alert policy is something that is set in Office 365 E3 and E5 uh, by things like advanced threat protection or by uh, what's it, communications compliance policies. An alert policy basically says, you know what, if something happens uh, and uh, it's an event like, uh, for example, um, an email being rejected by uh, a, a phishing filter, and this happens more than a certain number of times over a set period, that, that, that kind of threshold being set by the number of events and, and the period, then signal an alert to the administrator and send email. Okay, an, an activity alert is a much simpler version of that. It's available in pretty well all Office 365 uh, tenants. And it basically says, you know what, if something happens, anything happens of a particular instance of an event, such as creating a group, let me know about it. Again, these uh, features, which are part of the Security and Compliance Center, they also depend on audit events. It's in either case, it's important to say that uh, because events have that time lag uh, in ingestion, you know, it's 15 minutes for things like exchanging SharePoint could be an hour for uh, for another thing, because those events are not ingested immediately into the audit log, there's going to be a time delay before uh, an alert is uh, is created based on those events. So that's the thing to take into account. It's not like you've got real-time monitoring of the audit log to pick up uh, new events. You could write your own version of that, uh, but perhaps that's, uh, that's, that's not going to be a very efficient use of your time. In terms of long-term storage, well, uh, it's an undeniable fact that many security incidents take more than 90 days to actually uh, detect. Uh, you know, I've seen I've seen some figures uh, out there say 140 days, 180 days, 160 days, whatever. In all cases, there it's longer than 90 days. And so this is a bit of a problem if you've got. Uh, the audit log restricted to 90 days. It's less of a problem if you've got E5 licenses and the audit log is storing 365 days of data. So it does create a very obvious need for many tenants that uh, audit data needs to be kept for longer than Office 365 will retain events. So what do I do? Uh, your solution is either to do it yourself or to use a commercial product, something like uh, Quadratex um, uh, Nova platform. 
in both cases, what happens is that the, the, uh, the platform, the solution will download the data, it will strip the data from our harvest, the data from the audit log at, event, at intervals, say every six hours, every three hours, whatever uh, value seems good. And it will shovel it off to put into long-term storage in, in another repository like Splunk, Azure, or, or uh, Amazon Web Services. And after that, you know, you can go and you can use the, the data whichever way you want. Normally, there's some sort of um, uh, processing that goes on to make sure that the information that's stored in these repositories is a little bit perhaps more accessible than the standard stuff that comes out of uh, Office 365. But that's the basic thing. So it's a, it's, it's, um, it's a thing to, to remember in terms of your planning to make sure that, you know what, if you've got, uh, if you need to keep audit data for longer than 90 days, then you, you've got a choice. You can upgrade to Office 365 E5 and get 365 day storage, or you can look for uh, kind of offline storage for, for, for data to make sure that it's kept for as long as you need it to be kept. So after all that very fast session, I hope I've persuaded you that the Office 365 audit log is a very rich source of information. It's got lots of stuff in there from uh, workloads uh, created all over Office 365, and it can help you really understand what happens inside a tenant. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, some of the tools that, that are used to mine the data uh, require a little bit of effort, you know, a little bit of PowerShell skills. There's lots of stuff online that will help you, lots of examples online that help you. And once you master it, it's, it's really worthwhile because you then have the ability to use that information to understand, to interpret, to analyze, to get a much deeper insight into how Office 365 works inside your tenant, which can't be bad. Okay, that's about it. Thanks very much for listening. And I hope that the, the rest of the event goes well for you and you enjoy uh, the ESPC 20 uh, online event. Mm -hmm.